Virginia. At least eight dead as the outbreak rips apart homes. Winds hit 83 miles an hour in New England. A Coast Guard ship overturns trying to rescue a fishing boat and a blizzard slams the Midwest overnight. Last chance, Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz fighting to stop Donald Trump's momentum ahead of tonight's big debate. If Donald wins the gen general election, who the heck knows what he'd do as president? As Mitt Romney goes after Trump, hinting a bombshell may be coming about the GOP frontrunner's taxes. ABC News exclusive. David Muir one-on-one -on -one with Tim Cook. The Apple CEO answers questions for the first time about why he won't help the FBI break into the San Bernardino shooter's phone. But this case is not about my phone. This case is about the future. His message for victims' families. And this morning, new reports ISIS supporters may be threatening Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg. And charge. The elephants caught on camera heading straight for a U.S. senator. What happens next? An epic close call. Live in Times Square, this is Good Morning America. And Good Morning America, pretty scary moment there for Senator Jeff Flake in Africa. Now, Amy, you kept the elephants calm. Yeah, well, we <laughs> learned, remember, I did, that the slowest elephant can outrun the fastest man. Human. Yeah. Thankfully, they can't outrun, the, outrun those safari jeeps, though. That's right. Yes. Well, welcome back. Thank Great you. trip. We have a lot of news to get to this morning, including this rescue unfolding right now. Let's take a live look at Rockaway, Queens. Now, what happened this morning, a fishing boat got in trouble, and a Coast Guard ship went in to get it. You see how rocky the whoa, seas are right whoa. there, and the Coast Guard ship actually overturned. So far, everyone is okay, but the rescue is going on right now. We're going to stay on top of this this morning. Oh, my goodness. And then take a look now at Waverly, Virginia, where a state of emergency was declared. 53 reported tornadoes in just the last 48 hours. They stretch from Texas up to Virginia, and at least eight weather-related deaths and more than 70,000 people without power this morning. We have full team coverage tracking it all, and we begin with ABC's Gio Benitez in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Good morning to you, Gio. Amy, good morning to you. The rain is still coming down, and there is just so much debris all over the place. Just take a look behind me. This house and barn just completely destroyed, and we're seeing damage like this all across the east. Overnight, a tornado emergency. Twisters touching down along the east coast. A state of emergency issued in Virginia after a tornado went tearing through the farming town of Waverly. Everything on Main Street is down, damaged, some houses. One house was caught on fire. Four people were killed, including a toddler. The search continues this morning for more victims. In North Carolina, this twister caught on camera. It was pretty, pretty terrifying. It felt like the whole house was shaking. Seven houses ripped apart and dozens more suffering major damage. It's amazing that no one is hurt with all the damage we have. And in the Midwest, whiteout conditions creating havoc for drivers. In Illinois, highways littered with cars after nearly a foot of wet snow fell. Overnight, torrential rain slamming the northeast. Blinding conditions forcing drivers to pull off roads. Winds packing such a powerful punch, this semi-tractor trailer getting knocked to its side on New York City's heavily trafficked George Washington Bridge. Power lines downed and igniting across New Jersey. And in Philadelphia, winds dropping trees on cars and houses. The storm forcing nearly 3,000 flight cancellations, 1,200 flights into and out of Chicago alone. And back here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, we can tell you the National Weather Service will be coming out here to look at this damage to see if that was caused by a tornado or not. But the good news right now, perhaps a miracle, no injuries and no deaths reported, Sam. Unbelievable, Gio, and the damage there. So what they'll look for in this is whether the straight line winds was just a pushing damage or they'll look to see if there was a twist. If there's a twist, POW, tornado. Now, if you think that February storms aren't powerful, just look at the size of that tornado. This is just one of them that we were talking about. That one in Evergreen, Virginia. Now let's get to Waverly, Virginia, a town that's waking up this morning destroyed, a town that's looking around and realizing that at least three members of their community are dead this morning. Philip Minna is there live. Hey, Philip, just tell us what you see around there. Again, monster storm. Absolutely, Sam. Good morning. The devastation in this town is just striking. And as you mentioned, right here is where those three people were killed, including that toddler. But there are no signs of the trailer that they were in when the storm hit. All that's left are these piles of lumber and, and twisted metal. And, and over there, the remnants of what was just yesterday, a functioning laundromat. Right now, you can just see the washing machines just lined up there in the open air. 
Authorities here are still assessing the damage. Uh, we are told that they are, everybody has been accounted for, but it's going to take months to rebuild. So, Sam, just a, as you mentioned, just a devastating blow to this community. Yeah, it's unbelievable, Philip. I, I got to tell you, when people walk out the door and they can't realize where their streets are or where the markers that they knew every day in their neighborhood, it's it's unbelievable. And this storm isn't done yet. We still have some power behind it. Thank you, Philip. Uh, we've got a big blast of cold air. Some areas will still get some snow. We've got some snow wrapping around the Great Lakes, and in this was a big snow system as well. 15 inches in some cases in Indiana, 10 inches near Flint, Michigan. You'll get more snow today. This cold air charges on in. These are the winter storm warnings that are still out for that remaining cold air. So watch that low pull away and then know we've got some big changes in the Northeast all the way in the Great Lakes coming as well. Watch these temperatures from the 50s today. Pow to the 20s Friday morning, Saturday morning, just 12 degrees in Burlington, Sunday morning, 31 degrees. Take a look at that cold air in New York City. Now it does bounce back by the end of the weekend, but right now it's cold and windy coming in behind all that storm damage. Jordan. Heavy coats back on here. Yeah. Okay, Sam, thanks very much. We're going to move on now to the race for the White House. It's your voice, your vote, and with Super Tuesday just five days away, Donald Trump has lots of momentum after three straight wins. Tonight's GOP debate may be the last best chance for his rivals to shake things up, and ABC's John Carl is here with all the latest. Good morning, John. Good morning, George. We're down to just five candidates on the stage tonight. If the others can't find a way to slow Trump down, it won't be long until we're down to one. At a pre-debate rally in Houston, Marco Rubio showed a new willingness to take on Donald Trump, questioning whether he's ready to be commander-in-chief. You can't just say, well, when I get there, I'll hire the smartest people, and they're going to tell me what to do. <laughs> And in a Fox News forum last night, both Rubio and Ted Cruz questioned Trump's conservative credentials. We are not going to allow the conservative movement to be defined by a nominee who isn't a conservative. If Donald wins the gen general election, who the heck knows what he'd do as president? I, I mean, I mean I, you know, we need a president we can trust. Trump is also taking fire from the last GOP nominee, Mitt Romney, over his unreleased tax returns. I think we have good reason to believe that there's a bombshell in Donald Trump's taxes. When people decide they don't want to give you their taxes, it's usually because there's something they don't want you to see. Trump fired back, tweeting that Romney, quote, blew an election that should have been won and is now playing the tough guy. Coming off three straight wins, Trump now seems confident he's on his way to the nomination. I mean, it's going to be an amazing two months. We might not even need the two months, folks, to be honest, all right? He's even musing about his potential vice presidential pick. The outsider saying he may go with a Washington insider. I do want somebody that's political because I want to get lots of great legislation that we all want passed that's just sitting there for years and years and years. Trump is also getting his first insider support just yesterday, George. He was endorsed by two junior members of Congress, his very first congressional endorsements. But as he told you just yesterday, endorsements are a quote, waste of time. <laughs> he, he did say that yesterday. You know, you're in front of that board for Super Tuesday right now. Let's give everyone a sense of why we call it Super Tuesday. What's at stake? Well, this is the single biggest day of the entire primary. Uh, nearly 600 delegates at stake. That is about half that you would need to clinch the nomination. You've got most of the big states in the South, a little bit of New England, a little bit of the Midwest. And, George, this is uh, uh, also where you can continue to get delegates even with a second or third place finish. And, and Donald Trump ahead in most of the polls in most of those states right now. So both Rubio and Cruz have to find somewhere to get a win. Yeah, especially Ted Cruz. Look, his home state votes. He's got to win Texas. And also, his entire campaign has been based on winning in the South. If he can't find a way to win some of those southern states, it is lights out for the Ted Cruz campaign. As for Marco Rubio, it's unclear where he can win, but you can look at where he's spending his time, George. A lot of time in Minnesota, Virginia, Tennessee, Oklahoma. Unclear which of those states he can win, but he's got to show he can win somewhere. Okay, John, thanks. Let's go to Matt Dowd, who's in Texas, where the Republican debate is going to be held tonight. And Matt Matt, uh, this debate, as I said, is maybe the last best chance for Cruz and Rubio to shake things up right now. Up until now, they've been going at each other more than they've been going at Trump. Well, we've seen evidence that Ted Cruz is willing to take on Donald Trump, but I think the real question mark is, on the same stage, is Marco Rubio willing to get into it with Donald Trump? And I think nobody knows the answer to that question. I think there's been an internal debate in the campaign whether they confront Donald Trump on the stage tonight or whether they just leave him alone and continue on the way. And so I think that's the million-dollar question, is will Marco Rubio take on Donald Trump on stage tonight? And will anyone pick up on this Mitt Romney uh, 
weighing in on the campaign yesterday, saying there might be a bombshell in Donald Trump's tax returns. Of course, he faced questions uh, as well. You think anyone will pick up that uh, attack? I don't think so. It seems a bizarre line of, of attack by Mitt Romney, who, as you say, was attacked by his, on his tax returns by the former majority leader, Harry Reid, in the course of this. My advice to Mitt Romney, there's a lot of vulnerabilities Donald Trump has, but don't go after Donald Trump on tax returns, wealth, or car elevators. <laughs> okay, Matt, Dad, thanks very much. You're going to be joining us uh, on Super Tuesday, and you all can stay with us on Super Tuesday. I'll be here with our whole political team for a primetime special at 10 Eastern, plus full coverage on GMA and World News tonight. All right, and now to uh, another battle, this one between Apple and the government over national security and privacy. In an ABC News exclusive World News Tonight, anchor David Muir sat down one-on-one -on -one with Apple CEO Tim Cook to find out why the company is refusing the government's request to unlock the San Bernardino killer's iPhone. As we sit here, you know some of the families of the victims in San Bernardino have now come out in support of the judge's order that Apple helped the FBI unlock that iPhone. One family reportedly saying we're angry and confused as to why Apple is refusing to do this. What would you say to those families tonight? David, they have our deepest sympathy. What they've been through, no one should have to go through. Apple has cooperated with the FBI fully in this case. Uh, they came to us and asked us for all the information we had on this phone, and we gave everything that we had. But this case is not about one phone. This case is about the future. What, what is at stake here is, can the government compel Apple to write software that we believe would make hundreds of millions of customers vulnerable around the world, including the U.S.? And you'd have to write that system in order to unlock that phone? Yes. Yes. This is so, we, we have no more information about this phone. The only way to get information, at least currently the only way we know, would be to write a piece of software that we view as sort of the software equivalent of cancer. We think it's bad news to write. We would never write it. We have never written it. And that is what is at stake here. The FBI, though, says it believes that Syed Farouk used that phone to communicate with his wife, his accomplice. And I'm curious, do you struggle at all with the possibility that there could be information on that phone that could reveal other plots, other people who were involved in planning the San Bernardino attack? David, if we knew a way to get the information on the phone that we haven't already given, if we knew a way to do this that would not expose hundreds of millions of other people to issues, we would obviously do it. But in your quiet moments, do you have any concern that you might be able to prevent a terrorist attack by breaking into that phone? David, some things are hard, and some things are right, and some things are both. This is one of those things. And in this case, you believe there are some things that just should never be created. Correct. As we walked across the Apple campus, it was not lost on us that this would have been Steve Jobs' 61st birthday. Cook says not a day goes by that he doesn't think about his iconic predecessor. I did think about what he would do. Uh, and I am so convinced, knowing Steve, Steve always did what he thought was right. And it is so clear to me that he loved what America was founded on so much and would do nothing to put all of these customers at risk. He'd be doing the same thing. And joining me now, ABC's senior justice correspondent Pierre Thomas and ABC's chief legal analyst Dan Abrams. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning. And Pierre, let's start with you because one of the points that Cooks makes is that if Apple grants this request, they may ask again that it will set precedent. What are the feds saying about that? I mean, I spoke to a number of senior government officials, and they're just not buying Cook's arguments. They say this is not about mass surveillance at all. One official told me the FBI simply wants Apple to develop a way into that phone that will be known only to them. He admitted that the FBI and other police agencies will likely come to Apple with new requests in the future, but he said each time each agency must convince a court to approve a search warrant. The sources emphasized that the San Bernardino investigation remains urgent because the killer couple swore allegiance to ISIS. They said they need to know if others were involved if, and if anything else is out there. All right, and Dan, publicly we're talking about national security versus privacy, but legally it's, it's more defined than that. Yeah, because remember, phone companies, computer companies, they've been assisting the government in investigations and thereby violating people's privacy forever. And the Supreme Court has upheld it. The legal question here is, effectively, is this that much different? Is this what's called an undue burden 
on Apple. And that's as much a technological question as it is a legal one. All right, and Pierre, I want to get to that other headline, the federal response. What are they saying about these threats uh, reportedly made by ISIS against Mark Zuckerberg? The leaders of Facebook and Twitter have been the subject of online threats because they openly have stated plans to try to block the broad social media campaign from ISIS. But a number of security analysts are skeptical of the video's credibility and whether this group really is core ISIS and has the means to carry out that threat. All right, Pierre Thomas, Dan Abrams, thank you so much. George, over to you. Thank you, Amy. We're going to get the latest now on that deadly rampage in Michigan. We're learning what Jason Dalton was like in the days before he killed six people, wounded two others, from the attorney for his family who's speaking out for the first time. ABC's Alex Perez has that exclusive interview. This morning, the attorney for Uber driver Jason Dalton's wife and parents is speaking out exclusively to ABC News. What's important to them is remembering the people who were hurt. The attorney revealing new details about Dalton's behavior in the days leading up to the shooting rampage that took the lives of six people. He's been acting different in the last couple days. Uh, and his wife asked him and he said he was tired. What made her think he was acting differently? Just his demeanor, that he seemed to be depressed and down, which was not his normal character. The married father of two, who only began driving for Uber in the weeks leading up to the shooting, now facing six counts of murder. When they saw him in court, what were they thinking? They're thinking, like everybody else, why? The motive, for now, remaining a mystery to even his family. Jason, by all accounts, was a fairly gregarious character, a good father, uh, well-known in the community, well-liked. Uh, and there was nothing to indicate that something like this would occur. As new details reveal that Dalton went to his parents' house after the first shooting occurred at this residential complex, telling his family that his Chevy Equinox had been sideswiped and he needed to switch cars, eventually taking his parents' Chevy HHR before heading back out. And then a few hours after that's when police arrived. That's correct. Police told Carol what, what had happened. I know you weren't there, but that moment, was she in disbelief? I can only imagine. We haven't discussed that, but she's still in disbelief. For Good Morning America, Alex Perez, ABC News, Kalamazoo, Michigan. Thanks to Alex for that. And Amy, you got some startling new video this Yeah, morning. this video shows just how dangerous e-cigarette batteries can be. Take a look. A man was putting change in his pocket. No way. Yeah, look at that. This happened at a gas station in Kentucky when his e-cigarette battery exploded, ah. literally lighting his pants on fire. The clerk ran after him with a fire extinguisher. Oh my the man gosh. suffered second-degree burns. Oh, oh, oh. And as e-cigarette batteries become and e-cigarettes become more popular, more battery mishaps are now being reported. So that is certainly a warning for everyone. One. And exploded. Michael, talking about uh, some really incredible video, you've got the elephant incredible. video. There's another warning if you see an elephant move out the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's we have a, a other dramatic video this morning comes from Africa, not from Amy Safari last, this week, yeah, which was amazing time. itself, but from a U.S. Yeah. senator who was learning about poaching, and he was on a fact-finding mission when he was charged by these elephants protecting their young. He got too close. They wanted to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. And Arizona Senator Jeff Flake, he got a little too close. And he is there sponsoring a bill to crack down on poaching, which helps fund terrorist groups in Africa. So he's out there for a good cause. Yeah. Got a little too close to the elephants. I got to tell you, too, when you see those elephants up close, those tusks, they look small there. They are incredibly large, and you do not Every want to be anywhere near Every animal in them. Africa is a lot bigger than they look on TV. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> I found exactly. that out firsthand exactly. myself. And maybe you've taught us a lot about poaching as well, you and TJ, yes. this week. We got to get to Sam now. More on those winds. I just want people to know when you're cleaning up today after all these storms, got a lot of trees down, got a lot of power outages on the East Coast. The winds are still strong during the day today. So here we go. 35, 40 mile per hour winds a lot better than the 80 mile per hour winds, but that's the weather around the nation. Here's what you can expect this morning. Make it a point to shop Kohl's this Thursday through Monday because Yes to You Rewards members take an extra 20% off and earn triple points no matter how you pay. Get a $5 reward for every 100 points. Plus, everyone gets $10 Kohl's cash for every $50 spent. You can earn and redeem rewards points and Kohl's cash throughout the store. There's no better time to sign up. Anyone can. It's quick and it's easy. Enroll, save, and start racking up the points today. Kohl's. Good morning. That's right. We are done with the severe weather threat, but now we just turn to a windy afternoon. On top of that, could see an isolated shower and temperatures will top out right in the low 50s, the upper 40s. But with the wind today, it is always going to feel a little bit cooler. I'd keep the umbrella handy as we go throughout the afternoon. It's not a great chance for rain, but I do think we'll see a couple of those little showers pop up in the 40s Friday and Saturday, but it's still breezy, so it'll feel much cooler. Sunday will be the pick day for the weekend.
Next on GMA, emotional testimony and TV star Aaron.